Okay, we're back. So this is part two of the part two, and we're still in the Netherlands. So I didn't want to cut off Rembrandt because I think he's such a significant artist. So um, we're going to be looking at him starting now. So Rembrandt van Rijn was one of the most important painters in the Netherlands of the time. Um, we're going to see several of his pieces, and you can figure out for yourself if you know why he's famous or why people liked him. But he's a, I think he's a very interesting artist. So he had a really long, successful career. He poorly managed his finances. He has a huge oeuvre of paintings attributed to him, uh, but they're not all, they have not all been proven to be original autograph works of his. So let's look at this first painting. It's called The Night Watch, but originally it had that longer title, The Company of Captain Franz Bonning Cook. Um, it's an assembly of militia under a gate. So this is one of those civic groups in the Netherlands that wanted a group portrait of all their members. So every person shown here paid a fee to Rembrandt to include their portrait. And he's taken Hall's idea of making it look like a scene, and he's just really gone over the top with it. So it actually looks like they are mustering to go out and either drill or defend their city. It was like a little militia group because there was constant threat of warfare from the Spanish at this time. Um, so let's look at this close up. It's a huge painting. I hope you saw the size of it. So it was well received at the time. Um, notice all the different people. So like I said, they paid a fee and I don't think they paid the same fee. So I see uh, some people getting much better treatment. Obviously the two men in the front scene um, are the leaders of the group and they must have paid the most money. But then I see other strange things like this man's arm going in front of this man's face over here. And I think, well, maybe the man who's being hidden uh, never paid or paid like, you know, I'll give you a buck, something like that. Um, there's a lot of discussion about this. It's one of the most famous paintings in the world. And one of the, um, one of the points that people like to discuss is the presence of this little girl down here. And the little girl is carrying a chicken. Um, I think it's hanging here on her waist. So she's got a chicken and people say like, why? What does she have to do with this group? Well, I don't know. Just don't know. So I can also say that it looks like Rembrandt is aware of what Caravaggio has been doing down in Italy because he's got a very dark space here and he has very selected highlights so the, he's using the lighting to bring attention to certain figures and others he's just letting them sink into the darkness. Um, I don't believe he ever traveled there. Like I said, he mismanaged his finances, so he ended up uh, bankrupt at the end of his life. He would not have had enough money to go to Italy. This is a link for a flash mob that's absolutely fantastic, um, so I recommend you watch it. I, like it. I would show it to you in class, but I'll let you go check it out. So I got some more Rembrandts. He's one of my favorites, if not the favorite artist of my whole life. So um, this is one that I really like and students tend to like it. It's another group portrait where a, a medical professor, a doctor, he's the guy in the hat there, is giving an anatomy lesson to a group of med students and they all have their fancy collars on. They all look pretty Protestant, don't they? Uh, but you can see that each face is very distinct likeness, so we know it's a group portrait. The body lying on the table is obviously dead. It is a cadaver that has been used for this purpose, for the medical school. Um, 
I think it's it's fabulous. I'm going to show you some more medical pictures later. It's just sort of something I find really interesting. So this is a focus is on the action rather than the likenesses, but the likenesses are still there. So Rembrandt also made a lot of prints, and prints, as I've told you before, were much cheaper than paintings, and ordinary people, working class people, could afford a, a print. They might not have a print collection, but they could afford um, to find these and, and put them in their house. So a couple of new uh, techniques of printmaking we've already seen engravings, and this is a new technique called etching, where instead of scratching the metal plate, like in an engraving, uh, you would cover the metal plate with an acid-resistant substance like wax or varnish and then you would scratch away at that so it's less labor intensive than, than actually etching into the metal I mean uh, engraving into the metal so you would just draw your design with a needle in the wax or varnish and then when it was just as you wanted it you would put the plate in an acid bath where the acid would eat at the metal in all the places that you scratched. So you would end up with lines in the metal that would work just the same as the engraving. So we're going to see um, one of his prints here. It's called The Three Crosses and it shows a crucifixion in um, a different way than the Rubens we just recently saw. So this time Jesus's body is on this vertical cross and the other two men are being hanged here. This is an early state of it. I think it's maybe first state, uh, meaning that you can work on your metal plate and pull a print and then if you don't like it or want to change something you can go back in and repeat the process, scratch some more lines in it and um, you can keep reworking that plate. So um, this was an early state, like I said, one maybe. And this is a much later one. So you can see the changes that he ended up doing. Uh, he ended up casting this thief practically in darkness. And I would imagine that uh, one of these is a penitent thief who decided um, and said while on the cross, that Jesus is the Son of God, and so that's why I think uh, Rembrandt is putting him in the sunlight. Um, okay, and here's another one of his prints. This is called the 30 Gilder print. It's Jesus preaching and healing the sick, so you can see a variety of people here. You can also see a variety of treatments. These people on the left side just look very lightly sketched in with a few lines. The ones uh, immediately to the right of Jesus are shown with a lot more detail, a lot more um, different values like shading on them. So, Let's look at his self-portraits. So Rembrandt created a lot of self-portraits throughout his life because he was one um, he was a free model, and he was always there for himself. So if he didn't have any anybody demanding his time, he could always paint himself. Um, it's amazing he painted as much as he did. So there's uh, one from 1658. Rembrandt also had a costume collection, and we know this because when he died, there was an inventory of his house, and... Uh, he had some old costumes, so apparently he would buy these this old clothing at uh, estate sales or from, you know, the families of people who had died, and he had a collection. He would dress up in costume for his portraits. He would also put the costumes on characters in his other paintings, so you see he makes a lot of use out of these clothes, but this is not contemporary clothing at all. Um, I, one of the things I love is his portraits. I love the faces. They just seem to radiate a character and uh, seem very real. So here's a nice group of Rembrandt's self-portraits. I love them. So look at the very young one here where he's wearing a piece of armor called a gorget and he's got a, he was not a soldier. He's just got that on to look fashionable. Uh, and a very nice uh, velvet beret. Here he is with his first wife. Um, 
and the one over here, second from the right, he is imitating a Titian painting where he's pretending to be a gentleman. I love that. <laughs> the bottom row shows the aging Rembrandt where I think they're done in the last years of his life. And you can see moving from left to right that uh, he, the figure ages a lot. But by the time you get to the very last one in the lower right corner, he can barely control his paintbrush. He just almost seems like a, a ghost or the, the paint's just very sloppily applied there. So that's, that's Rembrandt. Our next artist is also very significant, but he hardly had any paintings created during his lifetime. So this is Johannes Vermeer. His hometown was Delft. He's significant for a lot of other reasons. He didn't even really become identified, I believe, until the 19th century when somebody figured out that, that there was similarity between a group of paintings and they figured out it was him and um, sort of discovered him then. So there's his self-portrait and uh, there's the painting we're looking at today is Woman Holding a Balance. So um, he was neither well-known nor prolific in the 17th century, but he's almost universally admired today. People love his paintings. Most of his paintings are interiors, apparently painted in his attic studio. The window in his studio is almost always on the left, and it bathes the figures in a soft, warm light, as you can see here. In Woman Holding a Balance, uh, there's a symbolic reading to this where all of these various items are interpreted for a deeper meaning. In other words, it's not just what it seems, but there's another way to draw more meaning out of it. And that's something Protestants and Catholics all enjoyed. So let's look at this painting. So on the back wall, let me get you a close-up here. On the back wall is a... Um, a last judgment. So it's the subject that we saw in the Romanesque period of Jesus uh, judging the souls of dead people, bringing the good people into heaven and condemning the bad people to hell. The woman is holding a set of scales, tiny little scales, and that also resonates with this judgment idea. We even saw some scales in a Romanesque um, tympanum sculpture. You probably don't remember that, but take my word for it. You did. These scales are empty, so she's just holding them up. And that might also be significant. So she is pregnant, as you can see. And one very strong interpretation of this painting is that the woman is thinking, wondering what her baby will be like. Will this baby be judged to be good or evil as it grows? Um, but this style, this very solid painting, this soft light, this is very, very uh, Vermeer. And here's um, um, one of his more interesting paintings because it's so different from all the others. I, I told you most of his paintings are interiors with windows, and this one is not. It's just a head of a girl, a young girl, just turning and looking at the artist. It's um, been called The Girl with the Pearl Earring. A novel was written about it, um, sort of imagining who the girl was and why, why Vermeer painted this painting. And then that novel was turned into a feature film with Scarlett Johansson as the girl with the pearl earring. So there she is uh, posing in that pose. I don't know. You be the judge. This is one of his very few outside paintings. So this is an exterior painting of his hometown of Delft. I really love this. I, I've seen this in person. It was my favorite painting in that museum. Um, and this also brings us to another discussion, and that is that he cheated when he painted. I mean, a lot of people consider it a cheat. He used an optical device to help him put all the things that he saw in the exact location as though he were using a camera. So let me explain this, um, and you can tell 
there are certain little telltale signs in these. I'm not going to go into those now. This is the device. It's called a camera oscura or a dark box. And um, it is like a camera, a film camera, but there's no film in it because that has not yet been invented. So what happens is there's a dark box here that's just shown transparent so we can see what happens but it would be completely closed in with one small little hole either just a hole or a lens placed there and then the light rays from whatever object is outside pass through that lens and are projected on the back wall of the box so this is like a scientific phenomenon that occurs I mean you can do this yourself if you want to and you will see it happen so um, Vermeer used this device and he put a piece of glass over the back of this, uh, his box, and then he probably put a piece of paper over the glass. Then he covered the whole thing with a blanket and stood behind this looking at the glass as he was, uh, as the camera was focused on whatever he was trying to draw. And then he would just simply draw around it on the paper. So it is, it's kind of a cheat. And it's thought that he did that on all of his paintings. And that's why they look so perfectly drawn. Because he's not just using his eye and his judgment. But he's using a tool like photography. Um... So, Emmanuel de Vita, I showed you an earlier one of the Protestant church by Emmanuel de Vita. Now, this is, um, oh, sorry, this is a Protestant church. This is another Protestant church. Um, and it's supposed to illustrate how bare it is, but I think there's actually a triptych up here that's just sort of been hidden. Anyway, this is Emmanuel de Vita, and this is the one that is discussed in the text slide is a, is a Portuguese synagogue. So after the Reconquista in 1492, Jews were driven out of Spain and Portugal. The uh, king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabella, just decided they wanted their country to be 100% Orthodox Roman Catholic. And so they had to get rid of everybody who didn't want to sign on to that religion. And they drove the Jews and the Muslims eventually out of the country. And the Netherlands was very welcoming to these people with a different religion. And so there's a huge Jewish community in the Netherlands at this time. And this shows the interior of um, a synagogue. There's really no way you could tell. To me, it looks more like a marketplace or something uh, and not a house of worship. But I'm telling you what it is. And now we've come to another stopping place, so uh, stay tuned and there will be more.